Coming up today, President Park and Hay appoints three new ministers as she looks to make one final push to ensure her policy initiatives are achieved before she leaves office. South Korea's defense minister will travel to Songju to meet with local residents unhappy with the upcoming deployment of the THAAD missile defense system to their area. Plus, it's day 11 of the 2016 Olympics in Rio. More heartbreak for Team Korea as the women's volleyball team crash out in the quarterfinals. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6am on Wednesday, August 17th here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this morning, President Park and hae has carried out a partial cabinet reshuffle, naming three new ministers. The president hopes the shake-up will help her better implement her policy initiatives in the remaining year and a half of her term. Our presidential office correspondent Song ji Son starts us off. President Buck is gearing up for another push to implement her policy initiatives. A day after her Liberation Day speech, the president announced a partial cabinet reshuffle aimed at advancing her creative economy and cultural prosperity drives. Cho yun Sun, President Buck's former Secretary for Political Affairs and a former Gender Equality Minister, has been appointed to lead the Culture Ministry. I feel a tremendous sense of responsibility and duty to be appointed as the new culture minister when Korea is establishing itself as a global culture powerhouse. Through the flourishing of our culture, I'll do my best to help build a strong, beautiful and culturally rich country where people can live happily and leisurely. The presidential office of Chung Wada says it has great expectations for her as Cho has a deep understanding of President Buck's policy initiatives after having served as one of the president's closest aides for years. With her ample experience working for the government and at the National Assembly, we expect Cho will contribute to the advancement of cultural prosperity in the arts, content development, tourism and sports. Kim Jae-soo, the current chief of the state-run Korea Agri-Fisheries and Food Trade Corporation, has been appointed the new agriculture minister. Cho kyung gyu deputy director of the Office for Government Policy Coordination, will now lead the Environment Ministry. The two positions were widely expected to have fresh appointments as the ministers had been in their positions since President Buck's inauguration, leaving Foreign Minister Yoon byung se as the only cabinet member to have maintained his post. The president also named new personnel at vice ministerial level. President Buck's current Trade Secretary, Chong man -gi, is the new first Vice Minister for Trade, and Agriculture Secretary, Chong hwang gun will now serve as Chief of the Rural Development Administration. President Buck is hoping that the new Cabinet members will give her a boost in accomplishing her policy goals for the remainder of her term. The appointees will go through a round of parliamentary hearings and take office early next month, in time for the start of the next regular National Assembly session. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. Now, residents in uh, Korea's southern county of Songju are continuing to express concerns over health and safety since the decision to station a U.S. missile defense system in their area to better inform and provide reassurance. The nation's defense minister is set to hold meetings with the local community on this Wednesday. Our defense ministry correspondent Kim Hyun Bin with the details. South Korean Defense Minister Han Min Gu is scheduled to visit Songju County the designated location for the THAAD missile defense system on Wednesday. Songju residents are deeply opposed to the government's decision to station the THAAD battery in their county, as they believe there are potential health risks from the system's powerful expand radar. Minister Han will visit Songju on August 17th at 2 p.m. to hold talks with the local residents. The purpose is to listen to the residents' point of view, and if possible, the minister will give a briefing on why Songju is the most suitable location for THAAD. This will be Han's second visit to Songju, some 300 kilometers southeast of Seoul. After Seoul and Washington announced the deployment in July, 
that month. The defense minister visited Songju with Prime Minister Hwang Yuan, but they were met by local protesters who were unwilling to hold talks. China has also condemned the deployment, claiming that that radar could seriously harm its national security interests. South Korea and the U.S. have repeatedly said that that deployment is purely defensive in nature, and the system will only be used to counter North Korea's growing missile threats. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Now, as a follow-up to that report, the head of the U.S. Army has told his Chinese counterpart that the THAAD missile defense system poses no threat to China. General Mark Milley made the remark during a two-hour meeting in Beijing on Tuesday with People's Liberation Army General Li So Chang. The U.S. Army quoted General Milley as saying, the decision to deploy THAAD to South Korea is a defensive measure to protect South Koreans and Americans from North Korea's ballistic missiles. Milley also reiterated Washington's commitment to adhere to international rules and standards and encourage the Chinese to do the same. China's defense ministry quoted General Li as saying that the THAAD deployment plan South China Sea and Taiwan Straits issues are matters that can adversely affect U.S.-China relations. The third deployment has brought intense protests from China. Now, while the South prepares the ground to deploy THAAD to its soil, North Korea has reiterated that its nuclear program is here to stay. In response, Seoul says no inter-Korean cooperation or exchanges will happen until Pyongyang changes its ways. Connie Kim has the details. North Korea has reiterated that it'll not give up its nuclear weapons program and that it's not a political bargaining chip, as it's the regime's own protection from U.S. threats. The North state-run website Uri Min Jokiri said Tuesday that possessing nuclear weapons is a reasonable decision to defend the regime from foreign nations' nuclear invasions. Pyongyang's main propaganda outlet also said the regime was providing Seoul with a nuclear umbrella guaranteeing the future of both Koreas. The statement comes as an attempt to create more division within South Korea over the deployment of the U.S.-made THAAD missile defense system. Seoul and Washington decided to deploy the Advanced Anti-Missile Defense Unit in July in the face of Pyongyang's continuous provocations, including several back-to-back -back ballistic missile launches. President Park in her Liberation Day speech on Monday made it clear that South Korea has no plans to cancel the THAAD deployment, calling in a self-defense measure to protect the nation from the North's reckless provocations. The president's hardline stance on North Korea was also emphasized by the Unification Ministry, which said on Tuesday that even pressing matters such as the reunions of families separated during the Korean War don't take precedence over the current state of affairs on the Korean Peninsula. The Unification Ministry also stressed the government's stance, saying there will be no inter-Korean exchanges unless the North gives up its nuclear weapons program. This was also highlighted by President Park's Liberation Day speech when she omitted proposing inter-Korean family reunions for the first time since taking office. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now let's take a look at the latest from the 2016 Olympics in Rio and more disappointment for Team Korea on Tuesday as the women's volleyball team crashed out in the round of 16 to the Netherlands. There had been hope the team could grab a medal this year but it wasn't to be as the team was swept aside quite easily by the Dutch team at three sets to one. The Netherlands quickly took a two set to zero lead. But Team Korea's star player, Kim Young-gyung, stepped up her game in the third set, bringing the match back to two sets to one. But a comeback never looked to be on the cards as the Netherlands cantered home in the fourth set as the Korean players struggled to block their opponents' rapid-fire attacks. Another medal hope for Team Korea was dashed on Tuesday, this time in men's Greco-Roman wrestling, competing in the 66-kilogram category, Ryu han Su. Lost to his opponent from Azerbaijan 4-0 in the bronze medal match. Ryu, the 2013 world champion, had been among Team Korea's medal favourites. But despite owning the quarterfinals earlier in the day against an Egyptian wrestler, the 28-year-old finishes his journey in Rio without a medal. In the gymnastics competition, America's golden girl Simone Biles has secured another gold in the floor event and written herself 
into the history books. She scored 15.966, beating her teammate Alexandria Razman by almost half a point. The victory makes her the first woman gymnast since 1968 to win four gold medals at a single Olympics. The other goals came from team all round and vault. And finally, very few outcomes in sport are an absolute certainty, but Usain Bolt cruising through the heats in the 200 metres is probably the safest bet you can make, and that's exactly how it turned out. The Jamaican sprinting star made it look like a walk in the park, strolling home in a time of 20.28 seconds to go into the semis with the fastest time. America's Justin Gatlin and Canadian Andre de Grasse joined Bolt in the semis. The next round, the semis are scheduled for Wednesday, lo uh, Wednesday night local time. Bolt blitzed to gold in the 100 metres on Sunday and he's eager to add two more golds to his Rio medal haul in the 200 metres and the 4 by 100 relay. Now, in other news, scientists at NASA have revealed that July was the hottest month on record ever. They say it's down to a combination of man-made climate change and the effects of El Nino. Osi Young has the details. This July was the world's hottest month in recorded history. According to NASA, July 2016 was 0.84 degrees Celsius hotter than the 1951 to 1980 global average, taking into account both the sea surface temperature and air temperature on land. That's 0.11 degrees above the previous record set in July 2011 and July 2015, which had been tied for the hottest month. July also marked the 10th consecutive month of record heat, according to NASA. The United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says the record-breaking period has been 14 months. Scientists say much of the heat was trapped by greenhouse gases caused by the burning of fossil fuels. Record-breaking levels of El Niño warming also triggered the scorching conditions. El Niño has been developing since 2014, which caused tropical water to heat up. This then affected air temperatures on land, pushing temperatures up globally and caused unusual weather changes. As the residual heat from El Niño cools off, scientists expect the extreme conditions to stabilize by September or October, thanks to the cooler ocean temperatures of La Niña, which kicked in this June in the equatorial Pacific. However, this isn't to say global temperatures will subside in the long run. Scientists expect more surprises down the line. The amount of carbon in the atmosphere has been on the rise, reaching 406.8 parts per million this June. This triggers the greenhouse effect, raising temperatures all over the world. As long as global warming continues, climate change will, of course, persist, and temperatures will climb every year. Scientists say in terms of tackling global warming and its effects on climate, there's not much that can be done, except limit the damage by cutting carbon emissions. That means sticking to international protocols like the Paris Agreement signed by 180 countries last year. Wu Siyang, Arirang News. Now, electricity usage peaks in Korea at this time of year as the temperature and humidity soars in years gone by. Korea has suffered power outages, so there is a sense of urgency about developing more renewable and sustainable energy sources. For a closer look, at Korea's efforts in those areas, Kim Jeon reports. The scorching summer heat can easily force anyone to turn on the air conditioner, despite concerns of electricity bills and the impact on, on the environment. That's why there is a rising demand for cleaner and more sustainable energy sources than those derived from fossil fuels. In response to such demand, Hana Qsell factory of Imsong, an hour and a half car ride from Seoul, specializes in making solar modules with a production capacity of 1.5 gigawatts per year. And that's equivalent to 44 million panels for the amount of electricity used by 2.5 million people a year. Some of that is used to provide electricity to local households, while the rest is exported overseas, mainly to the U.S. and China. Each solar module contains 60 or 72 solar batteries, depending on whether it's for residential or industrial use. 
Hanakusa says its highly efficient modules have helped the company reach operating profits of 1 million U.S. dollars for the first time in 2015. Its modules have energy efficiency of 19.5 percent, one of the highest in the world and which set a global record in December. We coat the surface of the module with a layer of aluminium in order to prevent voltaic loss. This way each module is able to produce more than 340 watts of electricity at once. The company has similar module plants in China and Malaysia, while a solar energy-based power plant is being built in Austin, U.S. state of Texas, scheduled to be complete by the end of 2017. Meanwhile, a team from Taegu University say they've come up with a way to produce hydrogen from marine plants after six years of research. Since the Korean Peninsula is surrounded by three seas, I thought it would be more sustainable to find an energy source from marine vegetation rather than from plants and trees living on land. I thought it would be an interesting subject for research, as not many studies have been done on aquatic plants as a source of energy. The professor says there were a lot of challenges ahead since marine plants are mainly composed of glucose, which is difficult to decompose to produce hydrogen. However, the team was able to achieve that by using a cocktail of fungi to take the plant apart instead of the usual method of inserting a single type of microorganism into it. The professor says despite such breakthrough, there is still a lot to do to mass-produce the technology, including finding sustainable methods of cultivation, as well as more research in other related sectors, such as metabolism engineering. Kim ji Arirang News. And those are the stories we're following on this Wednesday morning here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Thank you as always for watching. We'll be back throughout the day with more newscasts on next scheduled bulletin coming up at 10 a.m. Korea time. So until then, goodbye.